Welcome to the Kroc Institute um, for International Peace Studies 2019 Distinguished Alumni Lecture. My name is Erin Corcoran and I'm the Executive Director for the Kroc Institute. Um, before I get started on my remarks, I would just like to take a second to pause and remind folks to silence their cell phones, turn them off. Um, um, first, at the Kroc Institute, we are constantly aware of that the accomplishments and fascinating career paths of our alumni are a chief source of our pride. Since 1987, when the first four students were awarded a concentration in peace studies, the Kroc Institute has graduated over 1,700 alumni. This includes over 1,000 from the undergraduate major or minor in peace studies, over 600 alumni from the master's program, and 21 students from our doctoral program in peace studies. Now at work in nearly 100 countries around the world, Kroc alumni found, have found a variety of ways to integrate peace studies into their professional work over the last three decades. Some identify as professional peace builders, while others have found ways to incorporate the knowledge and values of peace studies in a variety of distinct professions, from religious leadership to teaching to parenting. The Kroc Institute's Distinguished Alumni Award honors graduates of Notre Dame's peace studies programs whose careers and lives exemplify the ideals of international peace building. In the past, we've honored human rights lawyers and advocates, including Shabi Aguirre at the International Criminal Court, Vienna Colucci of Amnesty International, Adriana Quiones of UN Women. In addition, Ambassador Juana Popa of Romania, Chinese filmmaker Ji Yan Yi, Kenyan NGO George Wachira of NPI Africa, development innovator Molly Kinder, educator and activist Kersona Wise Whitehead of Baltimore, African journalist Obi, uh, 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 I'm sorry, excuse me, Aya Dika, and Mai Ni Ni Young, an entrepreneurial peace builder who is reviving traditional weaving in Miramar. To this list of distinguished alumni, we are now both privileged to add P. Carl, distinguished artist in residence at Emerson College in Boston, a graduate of both the undergrad and master's program of the Kroc Institute. Um, and to introduce to, uh, um, P. Carl is Ann Hayner. Um, Ann Hayner is our Associate Director for Alumni Relations. Since Kroc's inception, Ann has served as a, a key role in connecting our students and graduates with other peace builders in the field. Her knowledge and understanding of our expansive alumni network is remarkable. She has played a pivotal role in creating this large, interconnected, global network of peace building. Um, so I want to just take a moment to thank you, Anne, for all of your hard work, not just in putting it together the annual Distinguished Alumni Award every year, but all the work you do every day um, to connect our alumni um, back to campus and the work across um, the globe. So thank you. So Anne is going to come up and introduce our distinguished alumni. Thanks. Greetings. Thanks. Thank you for being here. I get the best job introducing our amazing speaker today. We're delighted to recognize Pete Carl as a distinguished graduate of the Kroc Institute and a pathbreaker in numerous ways. Originally from Elkhart, Indiana, Carl was not only a member of a small group of alumni with two degrees from the Kroc Institute, but in fact was the very first double Kroc alum. In 1988, he was one of five members of, the only, of only the second undergraduate class of peace studies and he earned a BA in English and Peace Studies, and in 1990 was a member of the third year of the Kroc Master's Program. In between and after these studies, he also spent time in Florida supporting union farm worker organizing and in East LA and South Central LA working with Central American refugees. In uh, looking back and preparing for this talk, I, I look back at the application that Carl sent to the Kroc Institute <laughs> 30 years ago and was amazed, and you will probably be amazed at this, uh, what he wrote 30 years ago. My journey over the last few years has been to come to a deeper understanding of the network, what Martin Luther King called an inescapable network of mutuality. My personal experiences of mutuality have profoundly influenced my attitudes and values, yet I must go further than simply recognizing my connection to a different cultures and ideologies. The challenge 
is to impart the knowledge that people of all nations live under the same sky and have the same basic needs. The threat of total destruction of our mutual earth makes this message an urgent one. I think you'll hear echoes of that same concern and passion in the work that he's continuing on over the years in perhaps unexpected ways. In 1999, Carl earned a doctorate in comparative studies in discourse and society from the University of Minnesota. The focus of his PhD program was film theory, queer theory, culture, and literature with theater only on the periphery. Yet after graduation, Carl became the development director of the Playwrights Center in Minneapolis, where, as he said, he fell in love with the theater. He notes, I immediately connected with artists there, I immediately started to talk to them about their plays. I've built an entire life in the theater pretty much by accident. Carl spent 11 years at the Playwrights Center, followed by two years as director of artistic development at Steppenwolf Theater in Chicago. From 2011 to 2017, Carl served as co-artistic director of Arts Emerson in Boston and has served as associate vice president of Emerson College, where he is now distinguished artist in residence. As the co-founder and past director of the International Theater Knowledge Commons HowlRound, Carl stands at the forefront of creating innovative knowledge platforms and cultural transformation models for arts organizations. In 2015, Carl was honored as Person of the Year by the National Theater Conference, which cited HowlRound for the enormous impact it makes every day communicating to and advocating for the field. Looking back, Carl says that in a way, everything he did was preparation for a career in theater. I think you could see in my career a commitment to social justice and activism, the questions of equity and inclusion. Those questions are the whys of theater. In the career I've put together, I've not lost any of those passions. Carl was a recipient of a 2017 Art of Change Fellowship from the Ford Foundation to, quote, support visionary artists and cultural leaders in creating powerful works of art that help advance freedom, justice, and inclusion and strengthen our democracy. In the spring of 2018, Carl served as dramaturg and produ producer of Claudia Rankin's The White Card, a play designed to facilitate honest conversations on race. We were honored to watch this, a powerful staged reading of this play last night and to be able to discuss it with Carl afterwards. Carl recently returned from a Berlin Prize Fellowship in Germany where he's been working on his forthcoming book, Becoming a White Man, which explores Carl's transition from being perceived as a queer white woman to living fully as a white man. The memoir, which Carl said is both a searing critique of and a love letter to, white masculinity, turns Carl's personal story into a broader exploration of American identity politics, transphobia, gender politics, and love. While he was an undergrad and a master's student at Notre Dame, I knew this talented student as Polly Carl and as female. A couple of years ago, Carl opened my eyes to a different reality when he wrote, I've long been sorting my gender ambiguity over the past few years. I've slowly embraced my transgender, and transgender identity. This hasn't been a clear nor easy path. I've worried I would risk my career, livelihood, and relationships. I've been desperately trying to live without pronouns for a while, mostly in the hope that it would not make anyone uncomfortable. And of course, I want gender to be something fluid for myself and for others. But in the imperfect world of pronouns, I realize she and her aren't me. I think the pronouns that get closest to it, to me, are he and him. It will perhaps make my life more complicated or maybe less. And when we see each other, we will talk about what it means and I will appreciate you asking me about it and we will forgive each other when we stumble over the words. In a 2016 interview, Carl said, I haven't always identified as a transgender person but I've always felt othered in a world, being a kind of short, always queer in some capacity, however I articulated that person, in a field that's often filled with people who have had access to means and support. Not having economic access for most of my, most of my life, being queer has shaped me as a person who picks issues around who gets to say what and when. 
creating space for people to be able to tell their stories and stories that matter to our cultures and communities is something that I've insisted on most of my life. Carl will today address the topic, Caring for Bodies Not Our Own, Storytelling as a Bridge to Radical Understanding. Now I'd like to ask Carl to come up on the stage to receive the Kroc Institute's Distinguished Alumni Award. Carl, the Institute, Kroc Institute is proud to recognize your dedication to working for a more just and peaceful world through theater, education, and telling powerful and moving stories, and to confer on you the Distinguished Alumni Award of the Kroc Institute. As inscribed on the base of the award, we are confident that you will go forth with peace. I was, I was told not to uh, pick it up because that uh, globe falls off, so. Um, <clears throat> uh, 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 I'm really honored to be here, and uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity uh, to address you. Uh, I'm, um, uh, I, there's nothing I uh, find more uncomfortable than an introduction, uh, so I, um, but that was a lovely one, thank you, and I really appreciate it. Uh, and um, I, uh, I was thinking about my, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time on this campus, uh, and one of one of my claims to fame is um, that I led the second biggest protest ever on the Notre Dame campus when uh, Ronald Reagan came to campus uh, in uh, 1988. Uh, and um, there is a picture uh, that my mother took of me. I was on the new, the the news, the South Bend News, and the picture um, it just said uh, at the time my name Polly Carl, uh, Polly Carl, and it just said protester. And uh, I always felt like. <laughs> I always felt like that was adequate uh, as a kind of uh, way of describing me, just protester. Uh, so um, this, uh, uh, I put together some remarks um, and uh, happy to take some questions after. Uh, the uh, remarks really um, aren't uh, that much different from my application 30 years ago. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what we, what we get here. Uh, uh, the l last week, uh, I met with a group of students at Emerson College where I teach. Uh, I often work with uh, young student actors. Uh, and of course, the job of an actor is to perform, most often to perform a character they are not. But this question of performance has become more complicated by the minute. Who can I play? Who can you play? What does it mean to speak in an authentic voice? What does it mean to allow others to speak who have been historically silent? In my profession, it was nothing not long ago to have someone perform in what we call yellow face, a white person playing an Asian actor. But now, in a country torn apart around skin color, our art must constantly be cognizant of the sins of history and reflective of the racial and ethnic diversity of our country. So when I asked my students to create characters who were not them, uh, to write a monologue from, uh, uh, from the perspective of someone's body that they could never inhabit, at first they panicked. Professor Carl, we, we can't do that. I understood their panic. They could not appropriate identities that aren't theirs. But then how did they learn to act? So uh, uh, we knew we could not repeat the sins of the past. And uh, this uh, got me thinking um, a lot about this question of um, bodies that uh, we cannot inhabit. And uh, this is a quote from a, a book that I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about today. He doesn't know uh, how long it will take him to get used to having time. Uh, it's from a book called Go Went Gone. Only I can feel me. I understood this for the first time at age 50, when I told my wife I was a man, would always be a man, and would start to live like a man. After 18 years together as a lesbian couple, these words made no sense to her. She never saw it or felt it, even though I had said it before. I had always known it and felt it. Why hadn't she? Why hadn't 18 years of intimacy been enough time for her to feel what my body was feeling? 
I think about my time in the Peace Studies program. I think about the efforts we made as a cohort to find one thing that we could all agree on, uh, which ended up being nothing, actually. Uh, <laughs> Is it common knowledge that it is impossible for one body to inhabit another? If so, what took me so long to learn this? Isn't this the very reason I committed myself to making art, to create the conditions for empathy, to share the feelings of another? A friend of mine said to me the other day that um, the conditions for empathy are now dead in America, uh, and that's an interesting thought. We tell stories through words and bodies and images in order to know what is not of us. I tell stories as an antidote to suffering, to move the obstacles of living a trans life out of the way. I tell you about my trans body as a form of survival. If you can feel into my experience, perhaps you won't vote for laws to deny me my sense of being. I once spent two years making art with a woman, an African-American woman. She would tell me stories of being her. I would hear the things that people said to her. I would hear the things people said about her and her work when she wasn't in the room. I felt emotional all the time. I was appalled. I was angry. I didn't want to believe what she told me. I was surprised. I was sympathetic. But could I feel what she felt? Could my body inhabit the feelings of black skin subjected to endless acts of racism? No. Was I thinking a lot about what I felt at the time? I'm, I'm sure I was. Uh, a therapist once said to me, Carl, stop worrying about what everybody thinks of you. Don't you know that 90% of the time people are thinking about themselves? Uh, <laughs> Do uh, I think of myself 90% of the time? I wonder if there is an app to track that. Uh, I fill up my remaining 10% with thoughts of America, the anxiety of climate change, the threat of the rising tide of white nationalism here and abroad, another mass shooting. What can I do or should do? Or what does one do awash in a news cycle of atrocities that has no bottom? My instinct is to move faster, to write faster, to put my body inside the urgency, and to run full speed ahead. Speed and motion mean weightlessness. Feet barely touch the ground. Words ricochet but never land. As a trans person, speed for me is not new. It has been a lifelong coping mechanism and effort to avoid a reflection that never looked like me. I talk too fast, slow down, my third grade teacher, Mrs. Bellamy, would say when I read aloud. I joined the speech and debate team in high school. Slow down, the judges in the extemporaneous category told me. You're smart, but too fast. My mother would scream at me, slow down, as I raced through the house to find my basketball or grab my bike lock. She would call me in from dinner, and I would shimmy down a tree or shoot one last basket or run for one more touchdown, spiking the football on my neighbor's garage. I would sprint up the two stairs into the kitchen and seat myself at the very end of the chair. The Edge was my nickname. Slow down, my mother would say, as I scarfed my food so I could go back outside. She took the time to be sure we had a salad, a cooked vegetable, and a protein, but everything went into my mouth like a goulash, crumbs gathering on the floor beneath my seat. My wife walks behind me like my mother walked behind my father. Slow down, she says to me. You're just like your dad. In Jenny Erpenbeck's 2015 novel, Go, Went, Gone, the book's protagonist, Richard, is faced with every fast person's greatest nightmare, nowhere to go. He has retired from teaching the, uh, from teaching the classics at a university and is now emeritus, which as you know means old in academic speak. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it does mean old. Uh, 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 <coughs> sorry. Uh, his wife has passed, and his lover has left him. He's the only one left who can feel pleased when he masters or understands something. The novel starts out like a nightmare for someone who reads as fast as I do. Richard really will have to be careful not to lose his marbles, and me too, reading paragraph after paragraph about his routines, making open-faced sandwiches of cheese and cold cuts, and then making grocery lists to buy more cheese and cold cuts. It's like listening to my father repeat his ailments when he was ill with cancer, 
short of breath, knee swollen, blood sugar too high. What does a lonely old white guy do and think when no one is listening to him? The third person narrator of Go Went Gone lets us know in every excruciating detail. But isn't intimacy a function of the repetition of details? Detail and repetition kill marriages. We get sick and tired of knowing someone else's predictable habits, routines, and responses. The sameness of the minutia drive us insane. Or we settle in, we learn that this is the trade-off if we want there to be someone around to bury us and mourn for us, drive us home from shoulder surgery. Repetition is the life and death of love. And no matter how fast you move, if you want love in your life, then the tedious repetition of someone else's life is likely to slow yours down. But Erpenbeck asks us to consider what we would do if we did have time. What if we were retired? We had enough money, there was no one in our lives to look after, and no one tracking where we are or what we're doing. What if in the waning hours of time left in a long life lived, we suddenly had more time than ever before? And we were a white man with gender and skin color that give us bo give body, our body ultimate mobility. Is time, or rather the lack of it, what keeps us from deep human connection beyond a lover or a family member and a few friends? Is patriarchy, racism, xenophobia, transphobia in part a function of time rather than solely a matter of beliefs? Erpenbeck is exploring and asking what it takes for a white German man to know a refugee. How can white Germans engage the immigration crisis with openness and curiosity? And what would they find if they did? She draws from the stories of the refugees who came to Berlin from Libya via Italy in 2012 and set up a tent city in the middle of Berlin's Iranianplatz. Her book's acknowledgment section suggests she spent significant time knowing some of the men who lived on that plaza. That her novel comes in part from her own experience trying to know bodies and lives suddenly in proximity to hers. And this is a quote from the novel. To investigate how one makes the transition from a full, readily comprehensible existence to the life of a refugee, which is open in all directions, drafty as it were, he has to know what was at the beginning, what was in the middle, and what is now. At the border between a person's life and the other life lived by that same person, the transition has to be visible, a transition that, if you look closely enough, is nothing at all. To understand a transition, to make it comprehensible, requires a level of knowing that is all about time, about a willingness to move backward and forward, to get the entire story of a life lived in all its repetitious detail. As a trans person, I have had to come to accept time. This has felt like a death sentence some days. How long would it take for the testosterone to kick in to allow me to have moments of peace in my own body? How could I ask to, be wait, ask to wait another one or two years after I had already waited 50? How long would it take for my marriage to heal, knowing in hindsight it would heal, for my wife to accept and embrace what I feel about myself? even when she couldn't feel it. Does she feel it now? How would she describe what I call healing? How long would it, stop, would it take to stop running from my trans identity to accept that though I only wish to be felt as a man, that I am, in a historical context, a trans man? How long would it take me to heal from the judgments of friends and family about a transition they could not understand? How long would it take me to feel comfortable with old friendships made new? I can't think of anything that requires more time than a gender transition. And yet I know if I lived as a refugee in a tent for two years on a plaza in Berlin, I might be less worried about how long it takes to transition a gender. This sounds like something my mother might have said to me as a child. Someone always has it worse off than you, so be grateful for what you have. I read Erpenbeck's book in Berlin where I was taking time to write about transitioning. 
Some days I felt trapped by all the time I had. A writer's dream uh, is time, and some days were dreamy. And other days I thought I might scream inside my office, inside a pavilion, sitting on Lake Havel, on the outskirts of a foreign city, trying to cajole time forward to know where all this time would eventually land my body. Does a body ever land? Thank God for Erpenbeck. I would read several pages a day, and I would wonder how she knew I was here. The slow pace of her book, like the therapy sessions I was missing back in Boston. It's as if she was telling me what I could expect and what I might do in the meantime. Cold cuts are big in Germany. Served with breakfast each morning. Mine served to be me by a woman I called Marlena Dietrich a boisterous, tall, blonde German woman who didn't speak much English, but we always managed to find our way through some kind of understanding. She quit smoking during the four months I was there. I had taken, uh, it had taken her 40 years to try, and by the time I left, she had been without a cigarette for 60 days. But I didn't take the time to learn more about Marlena, about the 40 years prior to the 60 days. I was writing a book about me, my transition, with the firm belief that a clock somewhere was ticking. I was 52. This would be my first book. I was in a rush. What would the app be called? My phone sends me my screen time each week, the app appropriately named Screen Time. Uh, <laughs> would the app of self-absorption uh, be called Me Time? What if I asked Marlena the questions that Richard poses as a starting point to get to know some of the men who have been living on the plaza? He has time now. And this is a, uh, uh, this is a list from the book of the questions that he asks. Where did you grow up? What's your native language? What's your religious affiliation? How many people are in your family? What did the apartment or house you grew up in look like? How did your parents meet? Was there a TV? Where did you sleep? What did you eat? What was your favorite hiding place when you were a child? Did you go to school? What sort of clothing did you wear? Did you have pets? Did you learn a trade? Do you have a family of your own? When did you leave the country of your birth? Why? Are you still in contact with your family? What was your goal when you left home? How did you say your goodbyes? What did you take with you when you left? What did you think Europe would be like? What's different? How do you spend your days? What do you miss most? What do you wish for? If you had children growing up here, what would you tell them about your homeland? Can you imagine growing old here? Where do you want to be buried? Imagine if we asked everyone we met those questions. Marlena isn't a refugee, but what would I have learned had I asked her even half of these questions? What makes me curious enough to want to know someone whose world only tangentially collides with mine? Why did I expect the people around me to engage some kind of deep investigation into my transness, the grief and pain and struggle of it all? Why was I surprised when I heard more than once, when does your transition end? When does knowing someone end? For Marlena and me, it came December 20, 2018, my last breakfast in Berlin. A quote from the book, Remorse, a Default Position. During the summer before my senior year of college, I went to work at a Catholic worker house in East Los Angeles. Founded on the philosophy of activist Dorothy Day, the Catholic worker agrees to live in community with the homeless. Day believed this was the only way to feel what it was to be poor and to advocate for the homeless, to live as precariously, to use Day's word, uh, Day's word as the homeless did. The only way to truly know a life you hadn't lived wasn't planning on living, was to choose to live it, to, in biblical terms, sell off all your earthly possessions. At 21, I had hardly any earthly possessions, so this seemed doable. I was curious about homeless people. My family had lived at the edge of it most of my life, and I was convinced I was only a few feet away. What if I took one more step? In what ways could I be helpful? How might I be helped? I lived versions of this curiosity on and off in my 20s. In those years, I had the least to lose. I served soup in soup kitchens, worked in free medical clinics, picked ferns with union farm workers, spent a short time in the Dominican Republic picking beans with women along a hillside. I asked some of Erpenbeck's questions along the way. 
but I was in my 20s, and when I look back, I realize now that I was trying to know me more than the people I thought I was helping. What did I want to do with my life? How could I contribute to the world in a positive way? This was my Catholic upbringing and what most people in their 20s ask themselves. How will I make a life? What will it look like? What is possible? What experiences do I need to improve my chances of a good life? Age has allowed me the de default position of remorse, or at least pragmatism, a form of remorse. When I walk by a homeless person, now I think, oh, thank goodness, I do other good things, but I don't give to the homeless on the street anymore. Remorse is a better word than guilt, to describe a life lived only partially knowing how others feel. Refusing the stories that lead to homelessness, for example, when you walk by the same homeless person every day on your way to work. It's hard to admit that sometimes I am only as curious as what benefits me, helps me tell a story, or further my own work and life as it is currently configured. Remorse is a word that conveys to you how bad I feel about my shortcomings and allows me to excuse myself from taking on more suffering than I think I can manage. Is Urban Beck writing as a way to combat her own remorse? I don't know her. This is a quote from the book. Richard has read Foucault and Baudrillard and also Hegel and Nietzsche, but he doesn't know what you can eat when you have no money to buy food. How much is it possible for us to know and not know at the same time? How many books can I read and still not understand this, the cost of slavery in America? How many times can I congratulate myself for knowing things as a white person that most white people don't know because they don't read and research like I do? Richard comes to understand that he does not know the classics after all. He begins reading the Greeks again, but now he reads through knowing refugees who are from the very places he has read about his entire life. The Tureg are no longer associated with a model of car made by the German manufacturer Volkswagen. He has met a Tureg, it's a person. Richard reads, Richard is reading. How often am I reading as a form of knowing? How often am I watching something to say, ah yes, I get it now. Erpenbeck calls out the scholar and the artist and herself. I bet she reads, is reading right now. My barber in Berlin was from Turkey. He visited there for a week, a week I wanted to get my hair cut, but couldn't because he was away. Instead, I sat in my pavilion and read and wrote. To my right in the office next to me was a scholar, behind me another scholar, two offices over a novelist, in front of me a journalist. We were all huddled together, reading and writing. What did we know about each other in the months we had been there together? And this is a quote from the book. Much of what Richard reads on this November day, several weeks after his retirement, are things he has known most of his life. But today, thanks to this bit of additional knowledge he's acquired, it all seems to come together in new, different ways. How many times, he wonders, must a person relearn everything he knows, rediscovering it over and over, and how many coverings must be torn away before he's finally able to truly grasp things, to understand them to the bone. His additional knowledge comes from people, men, men from Libya. But Libya itself is a word that condenses entire histories of people from various parts of North Africa. Each man Richard encounters has been boiled down to Libyan and now Libyan refugee. Richard is slowly reheating what has been consolidated to create a chemical reaction that can undo what boiling does, seeking residues of culture and history that make up a body and a spirit, and relearning classical knowledge by starting over with the ingredients no one wanted to admit made up our canons of knowing in the first place. Throughout Go Went Gone, Richard stops periodically to think about the man who drowned in the lake next to his home some weeks before his retirement. It preoccupies Richard much like his grocery list and his open-faced sandwiches. The body hasn't resurfaced. I have learned that Germans like to swim in their lakes, often naked. But no one will swim in the lake now. No one wants to encounter the body, Richard tells us. 
the metaphor screaming underneath the many layers of the novel. Read if you must, but what is underneath the surface of the words? A transition forces you to go below water and look for the body, your own to start. After finding mine, I feel emboldened somehow to look for others dead or alive. But what does this mean? Perhaps this means becoming a journalist or an anthropologist. Do I just start asking all kinds of questions now? While my wife and I were in Berlin, our neighbor died suddenly, our Boston neighbor died suddenly. She dropped dead at age 51 or 52 one Sunday morning. She gave no notice to her husband or nine-year-old son. She was just gone. Heading back to Boston felt like going back to a body floating undiscovered in a lake. We had only known her for a couple of years, but we share a back porch and a backyard, and our cars are parked in the same garage. She was from London via Ghana. Her disappearance haunts me. When I see a photo next to her obituary, I can't shut down my computer screen fast enough. I don't want to feel her loss. We didn't choose each other. Lynette and I bought a side-by-side -side condo. It's what you do in Boston. It's all anyone can afford. We were thrown together like family, suddenly making decisions about building a back patio, what stone should we use, which plants, what lawn furniture. I started playing basketball with her son. In Berlin, I bought a book about home, written by an author whose family came from Ghana, to send to her parents. My neighbor died, but her immigrant parents are still alive. Maybe this book, signed by the author in memory of my neighbor, would be some solace. I think my app just ticked some additional me time. Who am I sending this book for? Uh, we had a skirmish with the neighbor not long before we left. It was over a dog. They had gotten a puppy, and they let it run loose until it was hit by a car and killed. Then they got another puppy, and my wife and I told them what we thought about that. Now it's a dead puppy, and a dead neighbor, and a new puppy, all a part of my life, all things I never asked for. What will the man in the lake do? What will the man in the lake do when the lake freezes over soon? Is my neighbor's body already frozen over? Do I keep looking for it anyway? I was dead once, to myself. Thank God someone kept looking for me. It was people I had never imagined would look. It wasn't my wife or my parents or my brothers, as you might expect. It was a random doctor at a queer health center. It was a therapist I found on psychologist.com. It was a swim coach who found me in the gym one day. It was a poet who asked to read my writing. It was a friend at the college where I worked. Could they all feel me? None of them were transgender. We didn't share similar bodies. Who are we responsible for? A quote from the book. In any case, it was certainly true that no human being could be 100% known to another. And it was unfortunately also true that he, Richard, found this fact impossible to accept, particularly as it pertained to his lover. I keep ruminating on this idea that we cannot be fully known to each other. I don't want to accept it either. If not 100%, then how many percent is possible? I want to know this. It feels urgent. If not 100, then do we just attach ourselves to such a low number that remorse is all that is left? How many questions are we willing to ask? How deep below the surface of breakfast banter are we willing to go? How much time are we willing to take to listen to the answers to questions we may not have even asked yet? What percentage do my wife and I know each other now? What percentage do we feel each other? Can America use the 10% of time it is not self-absorbed to ask a body that isn't a reflection of theirs all of Erpenbeck's questions? What would we feel then?
I thought I'd go light. <laughs> <clears throat> Quarter till five, light. <clears throat> Carl, thank you so much for your wonderful lecture this afternoon. Um, I have a question for you about your work in the theater. You talked today about the notion of um, storytelling and bodies. You talked about the novel you read. And I'm curious to know a little bit more about your work in theater and how has this philosophy of um, using bodies, other bodies, uh, bodies that aren't our own, to tell important stories about justice, how has that been reflected in your work in the theater? Yeah, I mean, it's really been all I've ever, it's all I ever really think about. I realized after Anne read that thing from 30 years ago, I've just been writing the same thing over and over and over again, but people keep buying it, so it's good. Uh, the, um, uh, but no, I, I mean, I think the thing that's been so great about uh, the career and the theater for me, um, you know, the time in Berlin uh, as I was writing um, was really a chance to think about all of the ways in which uh, I have had an opportunity to be in proximity to live bodies and the difference that makes in a life uh, of, of working with actors, working with playwrights, working with directors, and um, the, the conversations and the way in which uh, collaboration and you come to storytelling together and there's something so profound about that because it is uh, it is a way of learning about yourself in the world uh, that challenges you uh, you often find yourself in um, uh, you know disagreement about a, a, the direction a story should go or the way an actor should perform or uh, way something should happen and yet um, you have to work it all out in person uh, and I've always loved that about the theater it's what's kept me in it for so long um, and uh, I, I feel like that is um, uh, that's kind of our calling right is that we we there's very little we can know uh, without feeling um, the presence of the body of another. And so I, the more um, I think about uh, this question of how much we can inhabit what is not ours, the more I know that proximity and curiosity are the only ways to get there. And uh, theater's sort of set up perfectly for that. So it's, it's made for a good career for me in that way. Yeah. Um, so maybe you could tell us a little bit about how your education and, 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 and peace building has affected sort of your career trajectory now and, and sort of for students here that are here today. Yeah, I mean, everything I've really done, I, you know, I was saying, you know, that what Notre Dame did for me, I mean, Notre Dame and I didn't get along uh, in some ways. Uh, and... Uh, um, so I'm really I'm kind of delighted uh, to be here uh, in the, for that reason. Uh, but uh, we uh, we didn't get along all the time. But the thing that Notre Dame gave me, uh, I think, was uh, an ethical frame uh, of responsibility to others. And I think that ethical frame is the thing that has really been the underpinning of my entire career. And it's and it's you know it's it's frankly why um, I've I've been able to do as many things I've been able to do. Uh, so the the work work I did um, uh, uh, with uh, the, the online platforms that I created through the theater, uh, all of that was about uh, giving voice to artists uh, that had not been um, recognized, not been seen. It was all about uh, elevating um, uh, the invisible among our profession. Uh, and um, so I really uh, spent an entire career finding ways to elevate uh, artists and voices and stories that otherwise would not have been told. And that really came from uh, my time here at Notre Dame, that uh, sense of commitment to that. In the last year, it's been very weird because uh, I'm actually um, making my own uh, art now and it feels quite odd not to be uh, accountable to every uh, human theater maker uh, on, in, the, on, on, in the world, uh, which I have been for a long time. But that, um, but that I think, uh, idea that um, um, if something would be important to me, it could elevate someone else, and always thinking that I was doing something uh, 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 in a way that would be useful to others um, is really what um, has kind of shaped uh, how, I, how I really think about doing everything. I mean, even, I, I have to be honest, I mean, 
I really, I wondered, uh, you know, like a trans guy lecturing at Notre Dame, I could get protested, you know, and like, or, you know, it could be ugly. And I, I really kind of thought about, should I come or should I not come? And I thought, you know, you just don't know. There'll be one person out there uh, and it will make a difference to somebody's life. And, and you, and I, and I think you just, just trying to keep that, um, uh, that sense of uh, um, the world forward, you know, and um, and the needs of others forward uh, somehow is very much fulfills um, fulfills me and my needs and has and it's uh, made for um, you know wonderful collaborations. Uh, you know, my friend Andon's in the audience, and we've had a lot of fun working on the Latinx theater comments together, and um, uh, you know, just just some great uh, things that have been a part of my life that I would not have that would not have happened had I not uh, been uh, thinking about uh, the ways in which other stories were getting told as I was thinking about what stories I wanted to hear, so. Yeah. Um, okay, great. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about um, being in a position where you may you want to help tell stories that aren't told, uh, make the the invisible visible, but they might not be stories that are your own. Mm -hmm. So, in the context of like the white card as a white person being involved with that, or working with Anne on the Latin Theater Commons, mm -hmm. um, particularly as an artist and not as a like necessarily someone behind the scenes. Um, managing things, but actually participating in creating the art. Does yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, you know, it, 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 for me personally, uh, I think it's been um, uh, sort of knowing how to be a... a be comfortable behind the scenes, you know, and a kind of a go-to collaborator for people who um, uh, want their stories to be told. And uh, uh, I think... I think um, you know, I, I sort of built a reputation and artists trust me, I think, with their stories. And so I think it's really been about building relationships and building relationships of trust. Uh, and, um, uh, and then, um, and then I, I think just, you know, it's been interesting. I, I've been thinking a lot about, uh, um, as I've been writing, um, I, as I've been writing my, uh, uh, my memoir, I've been thinking a lot about white masculinity and, you know, the thing that distinguishes white masculinity, and I, I've, I've now created a class on this, which is um, conviction. White masculinity uh, has always has conviction. If you, uh, if you read history, if you talk to white guys, you know, push comes to shove, they always believe themselves. Uh, and that... Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, it's honest to God true. I, honest to God. I, I, I didn't know this until I started researching, and then I was like, oh my God, at every turn, when you see like, oh, the Vietnam War went on too long because LBJ was convinced, you know? I mean, like, it was just like, you know, you, you find conviction. And I think what I um, have uh, uh, always lacked is a sense that I'm right. Uh, and I think lacking that sense that I'm right uh, is, um, you know, uh, it, it, it it costs you some things, uh, but it, it gains you um, many uh, great collaborators and, and um, uh, partners in crime and storytelling, and uh, uh, and being a you know somebody who has just been utterly curious about the stories of uh, people that aren't me. And um, so I think that's how I've sort of made an artistic career. Uh, and now you know it's kind of funny as I'm doing some of my own stuff. I all these people are coming around to help me, and it's, it's very fun to be on the other on the receiving end of that but um uh, but I've I've enjoyed that role uh, quite a bit and I've like I said I've made uh friendships uh and been around uh stories that just you know have really been life-changing for me as a result and uh, so it's well worth it Thank you so much for this. It was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, I'm an anthropologist, and we, you know, strive for understanding others. Um, whether, you know, at, but finding a word to describe that is always difficult. Is it nuanced? Is it yeah. embracing complexity? Is yeah. it deep? And so I'm, I'm a little curious about your word choice for your title, radical yeah. understanding. So I'm hoping you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I don't know. I always like words like radical, and I mean, just whatever. <laughs> 
if it's extreme and get someone's attention. But um, uh, but I think that this this gesture of curiosity is more radical than we think. And I think uh, you know a lot of us I think would would call ourselves curious. But I I just the more I think about curiosity, the, and the more I think about knowing bodies that aren't ours, the more difficult I see it, it being. And, uh, and you know, I, when, when I was working with Claudia on the, on the white card, and when I saw people respond, the defensiveness that came with that play, um, you, you realize this, uh, this, this willingness to inhabit a kind of discomfort in our own skin in order to feel what another might feel, it's pretty radical stuff uh, in, my, in my mind. It's much, much harder. I, I mean, I, I don't actually think I'm very good at it, and so I'm writing about it as a form of remorse, um, as you can see, you know, uh, I, I, I think I'm, you know, just, I keep, you know, wanting to be better, uh, I want to be better at it, and uh, uh, and I think you know anthropology is such a, I mean, it's such a, uh, it's such a complicated profession now, right? It's you know, it's uh, it it has its own problems, uh, and uh, and I think it part of you know um, recouping it, I think, uh, because I think it still matters quite a bit. You know, it's been interesting. It's like it's like with acting. You know, it's like you can't just say, well. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, I can't uh, inhabit another body authentically, so there, there'll be no more acting, there'll be no more learning about other people. We have to find other ways into those questions. And, uh, uh, and Urban, Urban Beck's book was really revel, rev, revelatory to me in terms of like, oh, yes, this would, this would be, you know, how would you create the conditions where you could just be in a position uh, to know bodies that were not yours, and what would that what would that, where would that take you? Um, and I love that he was a classics professor who realized he didn't know about the classics and he was, and he was emeritus, you know. Uh, emeritus should know. Um, so, uh, yeah, but it's a, good, it's a good question. It's a good question. So, thank you very much. I wonder if you can help us maybe think about the two different locations of empathy that mm -hmm. uh, I seem to have been hearing. Mm -hmm. One is in the individual and these acts of uh, transformation that take place through relationships and through contact. And even when you mentioned you know, about coming to Notre Dame, there might be that one person in the audience, right? So this very intimate kind of with a the therapist. And then it, I also heard um, that America, the e empathy in America is dead. Mm -hmm. Like the, the empathy that belongs to an entire nation. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if you can help us uh, think about uh, how are these two different? And if in individuals, um, the inculcation and the cultivation maybe of empathy takes place through relationships, how, how does it take place in an entire nation? And if we're dead, um, can it be brought back to life? Do you see hope? So yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's the real. Um, I, I, I think that's the real question, and, and as you see me kind of just l laying it out there as a provocation at the end, because uh, you know my uh, my of course my my grave concern is that our inability um, to empathize um, will in fact uh, doom us even more. Um, and uh, you know the the thing that I find. Uh, I th the thing that I find sort of hopeful uh, is that in this in this in this strange time of hyper technology, um, uh, poets are suddenly mad suddenly matter again. Uh, language matters again, um, and I think for me. Um, uh, that uh, even the theater seems, uh, uh, the stories of the theater seem to matter more. Uh, there, you know, there, there was this moment where we were all like, oh, the theater's going to die. Uh, certainly, um, uh, we never uh, thought poetry was going to make a comeback. Uh, and I think um, that this idea that the artist is coming center again into the culture is m my true belief uh, that it is storytelling that will get us we, we, we have to find new 
uh, new stories and new histories, you know? And um, uh, I was talking to someone last night who's on the committee to, um, you know, uh, I, I guess they're still Christopher Columbus ro roaming around um, some uh, hallways here. And, um, <laughs> Uh, which is hard to believe, uh, but um, the um, but you know uh, we, we we actually have to go. I, I think that that quote that I uh, said we have to go to the bone. We have to go to the bone of history, you know. And part of what is what happens is we rarely are working at the level of the bone. We're almost always working at the level of injury and 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 uh, and pain. And so you know if you think about. Um, uh, you know, when you think about what's happened to African Americans in this country, and you think about getting to the bone, I mean, until we talk about reparations in real time, and we create stories um, that include reparations, we, we will never get to the bone. Uh, we will only get to as far as the injury. And so uh, what I've been thinking a lot about is, um, you know, for America, it, how America takes itself takes the risk of um, uh, telling those kinds of stories that um, uh, uh, that will cost us something, uh, and you know the 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 pain, of course, is that nobody wants to nobody wants to feel pain. Nobody wants uh, you know to pay the price. But um, uh, but I think uh, it has to cost us something to get to the bone of those stories. And you know, obviously, uh, it's easier. Uh, it, it one can learn a lot from doing it one on one. Uh, one can learn a lot. Uh, I learned a lot. I I literally sat with an uh, you know an African American artist for two years probably said three words uh, and just learned, and um, learned all of the things uh, that I did not know um, and, uh, about being an African-American woman in this culture. And, uh, but I, you know, I was a pretty well-read, well-storied, well-schooled guy, and, uh, you know, I just, you, I, I'd never taken the time, uh, and so I think time is another piece of it. You know, time is a, is the excuse we use for not doing almost anything. Uh, you know, so 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 busy, I'm so 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 busy, uh, and uh, I just you know I'm not sort of not interested in that anymore. I'm like you have time or you don't have time. You want to know or you don't want to know. You know, and uh, you want to tell these stories or you don't want to tell them. That is up to you. I don't. I really don't care anymore. And, and so I'm kind of at that point where I, I am. Uh, you know, uh, I'm I'm getting to that old point where I just gonna do what I want and um, keep provoking America uh, to um, uh, you know change its story. We we have to write. We have to write a new history. Um, thank you for coming, and thank thank you for choosing to come, and thank you for sharing, and thank you for talking about reparations. Um, uh, I'm really curious about your metaphor about what does it mean when the lake freezes over, mm -hmm. especially uh, one of your earlier quotes from it was to put your body in the urgency. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of curious if you could talk about that more. Yeah, I mean, I th somehow that metaphor of the body is, um, you know, I'm really uh, interested in um, uh, the, um, uh, you know, the w when when we w like the lake freezing over, like we don't even want to, we don't we don't want to freeze, so we don't want to look, you know, and I think that um, you know uh, what I what I what I keep thinking about in that is. Um, we are, you know, I mean, we're in a university setting. We are a heady, uh, we are a heady culture. Uh, I think America works often from the head, not the body. Uh, and I think, you know, what you learn um, uh, as, as someone who's gone on the journey that I've gone on is that actually most of your life happens in your body, right? And when you learn that, you learn that um, the, um, the, it, that it's all about finding the body. That in fact, um, head knowledge, uh, which I've had copious amounts of uh, over time, uh, that you know, didn't serve me uh, uh, to, uh, it, didn't, it did not fill me with a sense of, um, uh, of um, myself, uh, and so really um, uh, discovering my own body, sort of frozen underneath the uh, uh, underneath the lake for most of my life, uh, makes me curious about all the bodies that are um, uh, waiting uh, to be uh, discovered. You know, waiting to uh, surface to the top. But I think that uh, uh, understanding that. Um, 
we feel much sooner and longer and more often than we think uh, is, a, uh, is a hard uh, lesson for American students in particular to come to. And, um, uh, and I think uh, that's uh, what, the, what the book makes me think about. It's, uh, um, it's what that metaphor makes me think about. It makes me think about the body is the first thing we encounter. And it's the, and it's the scariest. And the idea of the body in the lake, of the thing that we, you know, we don't we 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 don't know when we'll see it that it will appear uh, the the lack of control of the body I think is um, uh, what uh, um, you know wh what what holds us back uh, I, I don't, uh, many of you have seen Angels in America Tony Kushner's uh, uh, incredible uh, the twenty fifth anniversary I went to see it and. You know, there's a there's a, a great line in there. Uh, Lewis is a great character. In fact, if you want to talk about um, um, these uh, men of conviction, uh, Lewis is a great character. He's uh, you know this great uh, uh, Marxist, and he's you know ev everything figured out, everything figured out in his head. Um, but he uh, uh, there's a great line that Lewis can't handle bodies, uh, and so when his you know partner becomes ill, he cannot he cannot handle secretions. He cannot handle the fluids of the body. And I think that um, uh, I think about that uh, line in that play a lot uh, as a as another uh, uh, you know a, another way of what um, what what America is afraid of you know it's afraid of secretions you know it's afraid of um, the things that it might catch um, and and when you think of our you know I mean when you just think of this you know ridiculous wall um, you know that is I mean. You know, it, it, it is enough um, to make you go insane, but it's also enough to make you understand the profound fear of bodies that we have. Um, so, I don't know. I don't know if that helped, but that's, that's what I think of. Over here. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I'm sort of, as I was listening, what, what came to the surface for me was it almost seemed like you were meditating on what is the self. I mean, you said at, at one point. You're, you're almost lamenting that it's, it's so difficult to really know another, but at the same time you said it took, you know, this random people, this doctor in this uh, LGBT clinic, this uh, therapist you met on the internet, it took these random people for you to really come to know yourself. And so I almost see in that, I don't want to call it a consolation prize, but <laughs> it's, it's true we can't know another perfectly, but at the same time for, the, for that person to know themselves, you you're a part of the, you're a part of that. And I guess it's not so much a question, but I, I mean, how do you conceive of the self versus the other? It, I, I, th I see you like blending, blurring the lines a little bit uh, mm -hmm. in your, in your talk. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think, uh, you know, uh, I, I think that the, the thing you realize, um, and you know, if you if you ever are friends with a, a trans person or something, you know, you, you, you one thing you realize is that um, people are stingy. Uh, we have we have a very stingy little culture, and um, mostly, I think all of us are seeking some kind of visibility, right? And so um, the self, in in a way, uh, becomes uh, to be seen is just. Is, is is conferred when you are seen, you know? And I think that need to be seen when you've gone 50 years not feeling seen uh, is, um, I mean, it's a, it's a hole that you think may not be filled. And then these random people come and fill it. I mean, my, my great, uh, my, uh, if, if, my, uh, if my swim uh, coach knew how often I talked about him, he would think I was, um, you know, obsessed with him, which I, I kind of am. He's, uh, he, he's, uh, he's an incredible, uh, but he, you know, he, he's, you know, spent the last, you know, two years uh, teaching me about, um, you know, the things my body can do that I, I had no idea could do. And, you know, just somebody who takes that kind of time, I think, you, you know, what I realized was it, 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 it almost, it's like people doing their jobs uh, and, and, and conferring uh, upon others the attentions that their job requires is, in fact, often very, is often just life-saving, but that the self emerges um, from feeling what it is to be seen. Uh, and, um, and I think, I think many, many more than trans people go without 
a sense of self without a sense of feeling seen. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I think many people could talk about that. And I think the trans experience is very particular. It, 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 it's almost metaphorical in a way. You know, um, there's a line that I was quoting in this article that I really like. I, I talk to my students a lot about, but uh, the way uh, Erpenbeck describes the transition is that, you know, there's all of these things that happen on one side of the line. There are all these things that happen on the other side of the line. But the person on both sides is the same person. The person, so that refugee, you know, from Libya is exactly the same person as the refugee from Libya <laughs> when they were in Libya and now then they're in Berlin. And I think that one of the things that, um, you know, for a trans person is very much the same thing. Like, in one way, nothing about me is one bit different uh, than has ever been about me. On one side of the transition and on another side of the transition, I'm exactly that same person. And uh, but convince my wife of that, uh, that's difficult to do. Uh, and so um, I think that's how why transitions and 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 finding you know, you know how one wants to identify a self takes so much time because. Yes, they're the same, and, and, and then also, no, they're not. Um, and so it's both, you know, a refugee would say, yeah, I'm the same person, but because I'm not seen as the same person in any way, shape, or form, uh, you know, for my wife and I, when we go out, I mean, you know, it's, I mean, the worst thing that could have ever happened to her to be uh, suddenly grouped with heterosexual people. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> I feel bad. I feel bad about that, but we all so y we all have our burdens to bear. So uh, anyway, that's her. It's her burden. So. <clears throat> I have maybe a follow up question to Aaron's question about what what did you get from peace studies and how did that affect your work. I'm thinking about what was missing. Mm -hmm. uh, thinking back 30 years ago to the things that we didn't talk about, whether it's small things, did it ever occur to me ever to ask what pronoun somebody wanted to use? Mm -hmm. That was not mm -hmm. in my consciousness. Obviously the culture has changed um, a lot in 30 years, but I'm wondering from the vantage point, both of your experience while you were here, your experiences since, what what are the things that peace studies needs to be doing more of, at least from your experience? Maybe some of those things we have improved over the years, but what, what other questions should we be asking? What commitments should we be making that perhaps haven't been as, as clear uh, commitments and strengths of peace studies? What, what are our challenges? I mean, the thing I would just say, I mean, when I was here, again, and I, I don't know, you know, it may, it may be quite different now, but when I was here, uh, you know, most most people were, uh, it, it had some hand in, uh, you know, uh, conflict resolution, mediation, uh, you know, peace in that, uh, in that formulation. Uh, and then I was off um, reading uh, Tolstoy and uh, Brecht and Dostoevsky, and, and, and I, I, you know, I, again, I I think that from my vantage point, uh, I teach all these classes now um, that I think are very much rooted in my training as a as a peace studies person, um, uh, but from the vantage point of the arts. And I I I, I always felt again but only because I, it's how I learn is through the arts and through story. I always felt like the more um, the arts can be a part of that, uh, the more, um, uh, I, I just think there's, there's an opportunity for, um, uh, uh, you know, really understanding um, each other in a different perspective when we use the arts as a as a way of telling a story. And I, I just think it's 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 a it's very it's profound. And I look at when we did the white card. Um, the one of the things we did when we did the white card is we did a conversation after every single performance, and those conversations were profound. They provoked hard a uh, hard talk. Uh, and yet the, uh, uh, the play became a kind of entree into conversations that would be very hard to have in any other context. Uh, and so uh, I, I want art to keep, uh, you know, m pushing those kind of hard, uh, those kind of really hard conversations. It also allows us to see things that uh, we, um, you know, that we can't even look at unless, uh, you know, I worked on a play for a couple years with a, a, a couple of women who, um, 
they were uh, did a play about a female boxer who uh, was a kind of champion boxer and then was uh, shot and beaten and, and shot several times by her husband and and somehow managed to live and to make a comeback and we um, uh, turned that into kind of a strange multimedia musical sort of odd thing but one of the things we did was um, allowed her to be seen uh, you know, kind of bloodied from head to toe uh, in um, the, you know, just to really see domestic abuse and domestic violence uh, using, um, you know, the many tricks of the theater to do that. And uh, it was a really profound uh, piece of theater. Uh, and again, it's the kind of thing that uh, is hard uh, you know, hard to do in a class or hard to do in, um, uh, you know, even, uh, uh, even it, it doesn't have, the, even a movie, it has a different impact. But to see a body, uh, you know, that way, it was, uh, it was really, it was really deep. And so I, I think that for me is always going to be the thing I'm going to say about anything that uh, smells like the social sciences. I'm going to try to in, 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 you know, in, inflict art on it. Uh, so, <clears throat> thanks. Um, so I guess what I've been thinking about, kind of during this, is that in order for storytelling to happen, either people have to tell stories that aren't their own, or people have to be moved to tell their own stories. Um, and as someone who came to Notre Dame uh, very clueless and very straight, and today is much less of both of those things, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I feel like I've only recently, first of all, been able to come to know myself, but been able to see that I do have the power to tell a story that can change people's minds. Mm -hmm. So I think my question is, which you kind of got to two questions ago, is how do we empower other people to see themselves, but then also beyond that, like what power do we as individuals in a society, like how do we also not empower people only to have a relationship with their true self, but also to be able to tell that story? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I think it, 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 I mean, we're all different, you know. W one thing for me that has always been, I've always had this weird thought that I would change the world. Um, and so whenever I've done anything, I've always thought, oh, well, I'll do it and, you know, 10,000 other people must do it as well, you know. And so I don't think one has to think like that. But I think the interesting thing, um, when, I, uh, when I started HowlRound, which was the online journal, it started off as an online journal. And um, I was, you know, uh, I was in the theater. Uh, I was working in a very conservative theater at the time. Uh, and I was angry all the time. And I, um, and I, uh, uh, we actually, this was, a, this was actually true, we uh, spent an entire you know, fall talking about um, uh, how we were going to talk about race this that season, and then we um, programmed uh, playwrights by five white men. And I, you know, and uh, you know, and I was not in charge, so you know, I, I just you know blew up at home uh, where I was safe to blow up. But then I thought, well, I had to do something about it, and so I. Um, uh, and I, that was one of those jobs where I worked, you know, oh my God, I worked, you know, at 8 in the morning until, you know, 11 at night. And I went home at 11 at night and I cleared off my dining room table and I, I learned how to design a website and um, I hired an advisory committee that I paid out of my pocket and uh, I created an online journal. And the online journal uh, had representation from every part of the theater that you could imagine. And honestly, that journal in six months became, you know, it just blew up because it was filling a hole that wasn't there. But I never thought of it in any other way. I never thought, oh, I'm just going to write a book, put my name on it, or oh, I'm just going to. Uh, and that journal is now um, you know, the basis for a whole online commons that has really uh, kind of turned the theater upside down uh, with voices. And so I think, um, I think when you start from the idea that uh, everybody's voice belongs in the story, then you have you don't have any other choice but to do it any other way, uh, and I think that was for me. I just knew like you know. So, so if I wrote an essay, big deal. Uh, and in fact, I did write an essay. I wrote a really really long essay, really really boring, and I don't think anybody read it. But the journal itself took off uh, <laughs> like crazy. So I mean, I got my own stuff out of the way, and then uh, you know, but but people got to uh, but people got to tell their story, and I think I think that's um, 
I think that's, I think we're accountable to that now. And I think certainly, you know, in a, in a resourced college like Notre Dame, uh, with the kind of privilege that uh, the students have here, that if you're not thinking about who you're bringing with you on your journey, uh, then, you know, you're, 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 you're not taking full advantage of what it, this is offering you. Because um, there's room for more than just you. You know, and, uh, and that's, uh, that's hard in this day and age to come uh, uh, to terms with. But I think that's, that's our responsibility is to know who are we going to bring along with us. So, great question. I can yell. Yeah. <laughs> I can project. Um, what role does the audience play in this? Um, like, can you, as a performer, as a producer, like, hold them accountable? Do they have to hold themselves accountable? Like, can you talk a little bit about the audience and their role in, in the storytelling process? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I guess I think that it, the, the storytelling process, live theater, is, um, uh, in a lot of ways, it's, it's, uh, you're you're always thinking about the audience, and uh, so I think the the role of the audience. I mean, different kinds of theater uh, engage the audience differently, but I think the the um, the, the 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 really good uh, theater producing now is always thinking about the audience. It's the experience before the show, the experience after the show, the experience during the show. Um, I think that is, um, I think this idea of creating um, a sense of connection between the audience and uh, the experience is um, what uh, allows us to invest and believe that art has a kind of transformative um, uh, pull uh, toward it. And so, um, yeah, so I, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about the audience. Um, uh, I, I'm always thinking about the audience, whether I'm writing or whether I'm reading or uh, I'm, I'm doing it, you know, with some with something in mind. I'm, I want to forward something, whether it's a conversation or um, a political agenda or whatever it is. I'm, uh, there's something in mind, and I want to know if I'm succeeding in that. So I have to put in place, you know, the conversations that help me to know whether we succeeded or not. And, you know, I know it, it, one of the things about making theater, you often, the audience will tell you if you're, you've done it poorly. Uh, and uh, so I've, I've, we've changed plays, new plays, uh, you know, midway through, uh, you know, uh, previews, we, we will, will change a, we'll change a play because we realize that we thought we were conveying this thing, but after we talked to enough people, we realized we were not conveying what we thought we were conveying. So I think that listening, um, that process of listening never really ends uh, in when you're, when you're art making. You're always listening to how people are experiencing what you're putting out there. All right. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Pleasure.